deal we have deduced from the fact that there's been intervals between wars. Hundred miles down that road two and a half centuries ago, French and German troops were fighting against Austrians and Dutch and British at a battlefield called Blenheim. One and a half centuries ago, about two hours drive over that way, German and Russian and Swedish troops were fighting against Frenchmen at a battlefield near Leipzig. Two generations ago, French and Americans and British and Italians and Canadians and Russians and Australians were fighting against Germans and Austrians and Hungarians and Turks in trenches that extended almost all the way around the horizon. About the time I was learning to walk, American B-17s and British Lancasters were flying over this spot on their way to bomb Dresden. And at the end of that war, they drew this border down through the middle of Germany. It's the odds-on favorite place for where the next world war will start. Here in Europe, the forces of East and West directly face each other, and it's the only place where they do. When they met here in 1945, they were allies. The mood is different now, and the preparations are not for peace. When you've got soldiers who are busy, who are doing the things that they're going to have to do when the war starts because the initial things that my troopers will be doing is scouting. And as soon as the major formations are detected, then we will kill them. Looking east, American NATO soldiers see the frontline troops of communist tyranny. Looking west, Warsaw Pact border guards see the western forces of reaction and imperialism. They all think that they are in a unique confrontation. NATO and the Warsaw Pact are the particular labels this time around, but these are only the latest in a long series of opposing alliances part of a system which has given us, on average, a major war every 50 years for the past three centuries, 